Hello and welcome to another episode of Student Garden's Thought Leader Series. Today I'm joined with Luca Challa. Luca, welcome. Thank you very much, George. Thanks for having me. Really excited to um, to have you um, on for a conversation today, Luca. Um, you're obviously in an organisation, AIG Education at the moment. Would love for you to kind of tell us a little bit about your role there um, and what kind of your day to day looks like, just to give people a bit of um, bit of context. Sure. Thanks, George. And again, thanks for having me. This is really exciting. So um, AIG Education is an agency, an education mm-hmm. agency. So we place students into universities around the world, mainly Australia and New Zealand, although we're looking to place those students outside uh, Oceania. Uh, we're also developing our own technology. Oh, cool. I do come from an um, international student recruitment background as well as a net tech background. Mm-hmm. And so I thought this was the perfect role after about 15 years across recruitment and net tech to bring the two together and do something quite new that I didn't know quite as much. I've worked with agencies throughout my entire life, but never within an agency. Oh, cool. So my day-to-day is really, uh, part of it is the development of this new technology. Yep. And I think we'll see that the industry will move towards um, more and more efficiencies through totally. technology. Yeah, agree. Um, so that's the part, the most exciting part. The other bit is really placing students, counseling students, making sure that they go to the right university and they find the right fit for themselves. Yeah, cool. And um, we were having a conversation before we kind of jumped uh, jumped on the air about um, your, your terrific kind of career and the various places you've worked. We were talking you're in UQ in Queensland, you spent time in Auckland, um, obviously here in Melbourne now. Uh, when you kind of look back across um, your career, what are some of the highlights and I suppose what are some of the kind of principles that have helped you to have a really successful career kind of within higher education? I'll start with the successes, George. So um, I started my career at Deakin. I completed my MBA at Deakin. Okay. Um, they can have a history of hiring their own former students into marketing and recruitment roles. And that, to me, makes a lot of sense because when you speak with parents, students, agents, they can really relate to what you say. Um, I was really successful in opening up new markets in Southeast Asia for Deakin. At the time, it was a huge success, mainly because their focus was really on India and China, and I'd open up, uh, opened up uh, the Philippines, Thailand, and another couple of markets. Long story short, I injected, I managed to inject a lot of diversity in their international cohort, which is a mitigation cool. strategy. Yep. Um, at RMIT, uh, maybe the, the biggest success was, you might remember in 2018, there was a diplomatic spat between Canada and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I don't know right. if you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. that. The Saudis have a, well, a checkered human rights yeah, history. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. not go there. But, but some Canadian politicians said something about, about that. And the Crown Prince reacted by saying, you Saudi students that are based in Canada, you have to return to Riyadh and we'll deploy you out to other English-speaking countries. Oh, wow, was, I definitely don't remember that. Yes, yeah. it was it was a huge mess. And obviously, we had all these very stressed students in, in Canada looking to relocate somewhere else. Um, we did some really, really interesting stuff, George. And you coming from the social garden, you would understand, like, marketing campaigns in Arabic, geo-targeted yeah. and, and aiming at students based in Canada. And um, we managed to get about 300 Saudi students. Uh, This was semester one, uh, 2019, which was the largest intake of Saudi students ever for an Australian university. It was quite successful because the bureaucracy in Saudi is particularly complex. So there's a lot of work that you need to do with the cultural missions to, to achieve that. Um, after that, I shifted to domestic recruitment mm. at the University of Queensland. That was really, really interesting uh, because we were successful in uh, postgraduate domestic. Um, that's something that most universities don't even consider because there's not, they have the they don't think there's enough money in postgraduate domestic. I was going to say it's a smaller market, right? So, but there is. Yeah. Uh, it's just that because you don't have the agent channel and you don't have the school counselors mm-hmm. channel. They just tend to forget that there is opportunities there. The the reality is that if you find a way to engage postgraduate domestic students, you'll get a few. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was during COVID when a lot of more mature students wanted to look into upskilling and and kind of acquire new skills as they were waiting out the pandemic. So that that was a great, great success. 
Um, and the last one that I'd like to mention is probably the ambassador platform. That's what, that was my shift from oh, cool. from a university to yeah. a, 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 an ed tech company. Uh, I was director of sales and and uh, when I started in the role, the, the brand was already established, but I made it a household name in the Australian market. That, that was that was pretty cool. And we almost managed to drive competition out of, of Australia. Yeah. I, I can mention the competition is, is Unibody, but that, yeah. that was really, really good, both because I learned how to do sales. And some of us think of international recruitment as sales, but it's actually quite different. And two, because it was my first venture into new technologies. Mm. Cool. Yeah. And um, on that note, you know, obviously you've kind of seen how technology has evolved over the last 10 years. Obviously, we're going through um, an incredible rate of change with kind of AI hitting the mainstream at the moment. How have you kind of seen technology evolve and um, change the way students discover, engage and enroll um, with, with universities, you know, here in Australia and abroad? It's, it's a great question. I'll start by saying, George, and I'm hoping that I'm not offending anyone. There's a lot of good technology out there. There's also a lot of bad yep. technology. My view is that the best technology is the technology that augments or, or, leverage, or leverages human capability versus replacing mm. it all together. So I'm a big fan of technologies like Unibody, the ambassador platform, some admissions technologies that really help um, recruitment, admissions or marketing staff do their job versus completely replacing totally. them. Yeah. I think, George, that especially in what we do, marketing and international student recruitment, the personal touch is still very, very critical and we can't lose that. Um, so, so to me, a good technology is a, a technology that leverages human capability. I think where technologies can help is efficiencies mm -hmm. and effectiveness. Efficiencies because <laughs> if they do introduce a student cap, there's going to be less and less money. Mm -hmm. And so every, anything and everything that repl not replaces but helps universities complete repetitive, costly tasks will help. Um, and I'm referring in particular to admissions. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier about a place like RMIT that might receive 150,000 applications a mm. year from international students. Only about 10% of those, maybe 15% of those become enrollment. So it's a huge amount of resources for very little return. If you can automate some of those admissions tasks, then you can save a significant amount of money. But, um, but I think the next big thing will be uh, GT assessment, genuine mm. temporary entrant assessment. That's where universities are focusing all their money, all their time at the moment. And so if there was a way, maybe through AI, to somewhat um, do a GTE assessment in a quicker mm. uh, way without, without investing so many human resources, then I think that would be an absolute winner. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of effectiveness, I think anything that shortens the distance between the prospective student or their parents and the, the university is a good technology. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, let's say a country like India, there's maybe up to 50 cities with more than 3 million people, yeah. cities that I couldn't even pronounce. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but you could find possibly 100 students there that are interested in coming to, to your university, yet you can't possibly be everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. So. Um, technologies that, again, bring the student closer to the university without a university representative being there, talking face-to-face -face with them, will really, really help. Whether that's AI, whether that's a technology like the ambassador platform that connects future students with student ambassadors, it doesn't really matter as long as it brings the students and the university closer together. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about, and I totally agree, um, in terms of kind of the enablement of human capability is, is much more so than the replacement. I think, you know, in the context of the other side of our business um, is real estate. And, you know, we have agents who are, um, you know, talking about various different projects. I mean, the average agent can probably manage somewhere between five to 10 projects at one time. We're talking like new development projects, apartment buildings. And, and you know, what we've been able to do with technology is to make it much easier for them to get the information in real time when talking to the customer. And it's all about 
servicing surfacing information to give them a timely response and just speed up that whole experience. And I think about the context of um, education, and we know this through the work that we do um, with our call centre here, is like, how could you possibly know the hundreds and hundreds of courses that are, you know, available um, when you're kind of working in one of those roles? So obviously the ability to have a knowledge base and be able to kind of surface some of that information, and, and like that's just one example where I think, you know, we'll see some massive efficiency gains, which is going to enable, um, you know, universities to obviously invest that money into other areas, but also just to deliver a better experience for the student. I agree. But if I can say, George, I think the, uh, uh, you're familiar with, obviously, the enrollment mm. funnel. That will work very well at the top. But when it comes to the student choosing where they want to go, they will still want to speak with a human I agree. being. I totally yeah? agree. Because they are yeah. spending forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Yeah. It's not something that you want to decide based on a conversation you had with a machine. I absolutely agree. Um, you kind of touched on um, you know, international caps. Briefly, um, obviously, you've had a lot of experience working in this space. You know, you know, there's still a lot of gaps to be filled in terms of what's going to, how this is going to actually roll out. Um, you know, what do the caps look like? How are they spread across institutions? But how do you think that? What impact is that going to have on Australian universities? And how should Australian universities be thinking about how do I get on the front foot when it comes to kind of dealing with? you know, these quite dramatic changes um, to, I guess, the, the supply of, and uh, the supply really of new students in Australia. If I had the answer, George, I would probably be vice chancellor at the University of Melbourne. <laughs> no, um, uh, look, it is such a good question. I can say a few things. One is that it is possibly the most consequential measure that I've seen, certainly in my career in mm -hmm. higher education, but possibly in the next, in the last 30 years. Even COVID was different because COVID was, there was a physical barrier to the students coming in, but the students still wanted to come. Whereas if we introduce a student cap, we're effectively sending out the message that you as an international student, you're no longer welcome. Unless you're incredibly wealthy yeah. and you come from a low risk country. I think it's gonna be very, very tough, especially if they introduce a cap at the course level I, uh, you, Swinburne University, can only recruit 17 Sri Lankan students into your Master of Business Analytics. Agree. Yeah. If that happens, because those caps are decided by a politician in Canberra and not by student demand, that's going to be very, very, mm -hmm. very tough. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if that's how it's going to be, I don't think we'll fill um, the cap. Again, because it's not based on, on student demand. <sighs> How do we deal with this? Uh, look, the very first thing that I thought when I heard about it was uh, transnational education. Mm. I think the dream of studying abroad will never die. And for, for a student, um, I've been part of the RMIT organization that have possibly the most successful, um, what do you call it, example of, of t &E yeah, in yeah. Australia, which is the, the campus in South Saigon. And you wonder why would a Vietnamese student study at RMIT in Saigon without coming to Melbourne? But the reality is that they pay about a third of what they pay they would pay in Australia. And Vietnamese employers actually value uh, students that have completed their degree at RMIT Vietnam much better than uh, students that have completed at the local university. So the, I think there's still a lot of um, prestige and, and value, value yeah. for, for, for students and their parents in, in sending kids to, to study at an Australian institution, but in their own um, country. So I think, and, and there's not going to be any cap on, on that. Yeah. And you look at uh, um, Deakin in, in India, Wollongong in, in, in Middle East, some of those haven't been quite as successful as they thought they, they, they would be. But I think that's, that's the, very, the very first thing that I, I would say will happen. Another thing that I will that I think will happen is is reliance on technology. I think budgets will shrink. Mm -hmm. I think there will be stuff culling across the entire industry, and what that will do is is again every technology that can help universities save money will be useful. I think George, what will happen is because universities have relied for so long on international student revenue. 
technology will start being infused in other departments as well. For example, research, for example, departments that are not necessarily connected with marketing or international recruitment, but the money to fund operations in those departments come yeah. from, from those. I think, um, and I work for an agency, so I shouldn't be saying this, but I think that's what is going to happen. A lot of universities will start looking at recruiting directly, yeah. i.e. without agents, because because it's a costly exercise. Mm -hmm. And and Australia traditionally has, has had a very, uh, has, has relied a lot on the agent network, but there are business models such as in the US where only about 40% of their students come by an agent. So it can be done. Mm -hmm. I also think, and I don't want international students to hear this, but I think the, some universities will also raise their international student fees yeah. Uh, yeah. because all of a sudden it becomes very, very competitive to get in. And, um, you know, a Melbourne Uni, for, for example, would get 200,000 applications, but their reality then might have only 5,000 places. So if you yeah. want one of those places, you've got to pay. Yeah. Um, mm, Absolutely. Mm, mm. And, and how do you see, um, you know, obviously you're kind of on the forefront. You're certainly an early adopter when it comes to technology. Um, you know, education's not well regarded and well known for being early adopters of technology let's be honest um how are you seeing i guess uh you know colleagues who you're talking to across the higher education sector how, what's kind of the response like to kind of this change that we're talking about in terms of you know the need to adopt technology to generate more efficiencies in order to kind of create a more healthy ecosystem do you think um you know the industry's kind of prepared for it uh, yeah what are you kind of saying you're asking me all the right questions, George. <laughs> I like that. So, uh, do I, do they see the need? I think they, they absolutely do. And as more and more measures in terms of reducing the number of international students coming in are introduced, the more they will understand how important technology is. Do they implement it correctly? Probably not. Yeah. Do they do they embrace it in full? Probably not. Um, I, I don't really want to talk about specific examples, but yeah. when I was at the Ambassador Platform, I saw this always and um, over and over again, George, where universities get excited, understand what it does, understand the implications on international student recruitment, but then once they buy the technology and start implementing it, um, they don't use it to full capacity and yep. full capability, um, whether that's because of a lack of resources or something else, um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I think what we need to understand, and I'm talking to my friends at universities here, is that once you buy a technology, then you can't just put it there and expect it to do everything yeah. for you. You still need the human yeah. component. Um, if you're willing to invest, your time and money, there are some really, truly amazing technologies out there. Um, so it's, it's a matter of understanding, yes, I need this, but once I buy it and once I, I, I don't know, embed this technology in my ecosystem, then I need to still invest money in, in actually utilizing it in, in the proper way. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, you mentioned the difference between good technology and bad technology and, uh, you know, again, like the technology is only as good as what you kind of pour into it in terms of extracting the value out of it. I mean, you know, the amount of times that we've come into organisations of, um, you know, invested a huge amount of money into, you know, marketing automation platforms or CRM platforms, where like maybe they're using 5%, 5 to 10% of the functionality. So, um, you know, often it's about having the right mindset when it comes to extracting the value and knowing that particularly with a lot of the technology that's related to AI is, and it's it's so new and early and in, in its infancy and there are going to be inaccuracies there are going to be um, you know things that need to evolve and change and get better but um, you know the best way to kind of um, embrace the technology is getting it in there and um, you know as you say kind of focusing on small maybe small enhancements that complement um you know the the person kind of working in the job and and kind of building out from there to, to kind of drive value 
And if, if, if I can give an example, George, when, when it comes to admissions, again, we're talking about huge volumes yep. of applications. Um, I've seen technologies where, um, for example, I worked at a university, I won't name it, where their admission system, in order for us to issue an offer, we had to complete 17 tasks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? I've seen so it would take an hour and a half to issue an offer. Mm. Now, I still think that you need the human, the person to assess that application. But once that all that is done, it should be a lot easier to, um, you know, yeah. issue, issue an offer. So I think it's, it's the combination of, as we said earlier, it's, it's about augmented human, human yeah. capability. There's always going to be a human element, but there are some repetitive, very costly tasks that can be replaced by, by good technology. One of the things I noticed when, um, you know, connecting with you and learning a bit more about you is you've built a... Uh, fantastic, you know, brand online. And, um, you know, I think, you. you know, starting to follow and, um, you know, read your content, obviously a lot of that comes from, um, you know, the thoughtful insights that kind of go into the content that you create. But, um, you know, for those of that are kind of listening and are looking to kind of grow their own personal brand within the kind of education ecosystem, what's some, of, some advice you can give um, off the back of your own experience is kind of becoming one of the leading voices kind of here in Australia and in, in that space. Thank you. Uh, look, m my view is that in, in the professional space, your network is your wealth. Mm -hmm. um, there are other skills that you ca can acquire, but your network is everything. Uh, we all know this, the best jobs have never advertised. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so that's that's the very first thing that I like to say for me. It's been mostly um, LinkedIn, surprise, mm. surprise. And I will say this, George, it, it, I'm Italian, so I think I can say this. Rome wasn't, <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. So it took me quite a long yeah. time um, to curate my profile and to connect with the right people. There's a bunch of things and stuff that you can do on, on LinkedIn. Um, my view is that, for example, uh, you might know this, you have 100 invites a week. Use them all up. Yeah. Um, don't worry about if you haven't connected with someone face to face. It doesn't really matter as long as they belong to your industry and they might be interested in what you have to say. So use your invites. Um, I was in business to business sales with the ambassador yeah. platform and I used the, the sales navigator, which is a uh, an extent, what do we call it? Like a, a piece of software that works together with, with LinkedIn and you can do very refined searches around the people that you want to approach. But look, at the core of what I'm trying to say is um, people go on LinkedIn because they are interested in, first of all, it's an ego thing. Mm -hmm. So they, they are there to promote themselves. But also what you can understand there is, is what their key problems are. Now, if you're selling, if you're working in international student recruitment, you want to position yourself as the only person possibly in the world that can solve their problems yeah. through your product or service. So LinkedIn for me is a very good place to understand what people are after, what they're interested in, and then you can approach them and softly start and start um, selling. So um, don't be shy. Yeah. Chat people, uh, chat with people um, all the time. Thanks for connecting. I've been following you. Uh, this is amazing. Um, can we have a chat? Or I'm interested yeah. in this particular thing. Um, curate your profile. Use all the invites. Um, Make sure that the content is fresh. I don't post too much um, about, for example, events that I attend. What I normally do, I take an article, and there's a lot of amazing publications yeah. in our industry, and then I write comments about that uh, particular article. And that's kind of, you, you find your niche, you find the people that are interested in, and, and in, in what you have to say, and they become your, your followers. And that's kind of how I build my, uh, my network. And I can say the last... My last three or four jobs, I've, I've been approached on, on LinkedIn for the yeah, job. So, so it does work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's all I'm, I'm, I'm trying and to say. And I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I mean, like a big part of this podcast is kind of growing, you know, our voice and, um, you know, LinkedIn's a big part of where we kind of distribute the content. And I think, you know, it took a lot of time to kind of get over the ego part because I think you kind of, you've got the people who are naturally, um, who really want to kind of push their personal brand. And then you've got those who are, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably a bit more shy when it comes to yeah. putting yourself out there. And I think once you kind of break 
get over that barrier and um, you know I remember Mike my business partner a couple of months ago said to me well all your average posts no one even sees them anyway thanks to the algorithm so um, just focus on posting content and the good ones will get seen by a bunch of people and no one will see the bad ones and I was like well that's pretty good advice. (laughs) Uh, If I can say George I also think that I worked in sales and I've tried everything, phone calls, emails, all those things are fairly easy to ignore. And of course you can ignore LinkedIn messages as well. But I think because people are on LinkedIn to promote themselves, if you frame it correctly, for example, you're approaching someone asking for advice, they are more inclined to respond because they are there to promote themselves. And that strokes their ego a little bit totally. so um, I find that the responsiveness particularly for very senior people is much higher on LinkedIn than phone calls or emails I yeah. agree um, cool final question um, you know we've discussed a lot of topics about um, you know what the, how the landscape and the ecosystem is changing I'm going to get my crystal ball out <laughs> and, and look into the future here or ask you to look into the future what do you kind of see um you know, changing over the next 10 years? And what do you think is going to be really important to people working within the education industry, but within the kind of context of Australia, the institution themselves to kind of succeed over the next decade? Great, great question. Uh, So uh, I'll do maybe short term, medium term and long term. Um, Short term, the very first thing that I can think of, George, and I'm sorry to say this, but utter confusion if they introduce this, the, the cap, which they will, and it's as detailed as I think it will be at course level, it will be just, Chaos. as I said, confusion. And I do not think that for the first year or so, universities will be able to fill the cap. The mm-hmm. reason is, as I said earlier, because it's not driven by student demand, but by some bureaucrat in Canberra that doesn't necessarily understand how international mm-hmm. student uh, recruitment works. There will be a bunch of very reactive measures as well. I'm sorry again to say this, but possibly redundancies and retrenchments. Mm. And that's just the way things are. I went through a redundancy at UQ during COVID. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't enough students to recruit. Um, There will be a much heavier reliance on technology again, because long term that can save money. And I think there will be measures uh, uh, such as um, raising um, international student fees and maybe cutting some of the agents out. I also think, George, and this is a good thing, um, dodgy providers and ethical agents will be driven yeah. out of the market. That's, that's a good thing. That's mm-hmm. needed. But overall, the industry will take a hit in the next 12 to 18 months. Midterm, I think there will be a sort of rationalization of the sector. And what I mean by that, I do not see a future where there's 40 universities in Australia offering a Bachelor of Commerce. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough students to do that. And so maybe universities in regional areas will start delivering courses that address critical skills shortages in those areas. And maybe RMIT will focus on technology and cyber and AI. And so kind of a more specialized type of of approach to to higher education. I think TNE will be very big for the universities that can afford it because it's a Mm -hmm. way to recruit students without being in uh, Australia. Um, And long term, I think we have an amazing opportunity, George, to completely rethink Australian higher ed. Um, Professor or doctor, I would say, John Howard, wrote a beautiful book during COVID called uh, or titled Rethinking Australian Higher Ed. Mm. The book was in response to COVID, but what is happening now is is going to have a longer lasting uh, impact on on the the higher um, education ecosystem. So that's exactly what he says in that book is exactly what I'm trying to say now. I think of a future where Maybe there could be less Australian universities. Mm -hmm. Um, It's already happening in South Australia with Uni Adelaide and Uni South Australia merging. Mm -hmm. Um, And and maybe maybe a a, a rationalisation of the system where smaller universities will deliver high specialised, diverse diverse courses. I I think that's kind of... um, kind of the, the, the future um, with, with strong technology. I think it's also going to be uh, the industry engagement is going to be critical. There's not going to be international or domestic students that pay $20,000, $60,000 a year 
uh, for to study if uh, to study a course if if there's not a job at the at the end of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we need to brace ourselves for, for impact in the, sh in the short term, but long term we have an opportunity to really rethink something that is no longer um, su sustainable. And, and I think that the solution maybe is that there will be less institutions than, than there are now. The, the reality is that if you're Melbourne Uni or Melbourne or Sydney Uni, yeah. you'll come out of this bruised, battered, but fundamentally as strong as you are now, or it's just a yep. bit weaker. If you are a regional university that sits uh, between risk level two and three, and you have a small cohort of international students, it, 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 or you are a private pathway college, yep. you are fighting for survival. Yep. Um, and so the only time will tell us whether those institutions will survive. Mm. Very thoughtful answer. So I appreciate that. Thank you, George. <laughs> Luca, it has been uh, wonderful having you on to kind of join us. Um, Thank you. For anyone listening, I really encourage reaching out to Luca on LinkedIn, um, connecting with him there and uh, yeah, staying listening to some of his um, his awesome commentary and, and um, yeah, thoughtful insights around what's happening in the market. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for joining us, Luca. Thanks for having me, George. It's a pleasure.